Hello, and welcome to our evening worship service here at the Church of Christ at Holmes Road. I'm glad uh, that you're here uh, worshiping with us. And uh, before we begin our song service, uh, will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer, thanking you for being our God and blessing us to be here to worship you in spirit and truth, Lord. Bless this service that the things we sing and say and are pleasing in your sight. Bless Brother Stan as he delivers a, a, a message. And uh, bless, uh, bless us as we just praise you in song. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's start our singing this evening, number 71, As the Deer. <clears throat> As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You alone are my strength. My shield to you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver. Satisfy you alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit. and I long to worship you. Our song before we have our lesson will be step by step. Oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. By step, you lead me, O oh Lord, and I will follow you all of my days. O oh God, you are my God, and I will ever praise you. O oh God, you are my God, and I. I will seek you in the morning, and I will learn to walk in your way, and step by step you'll lead me, O oh Lord, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow you all of my days, and I will follow all of my days and step by step you'll lead me O oh lord and i will follow you all of my days well good evening church welcome back we're glad you could join us for our evening service we're continuing to look through the book of hebrews and tonight we'll be looking at chapter 2 verses 10 through 18. 
Uh, last week, we talked about how the Hebrew writers emphasizing all in chapter 1 about how Jesus is God, how he's above all, how he's superior to the angels. Those all were things about chapter 1. Now we moved into chapter 2, and now he's really emphasizing the humanity of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not only 100% God, but he's also 100% human. And last week, we looked at the fact that Jesus had to be human in order to satisfy the promise from Genesis 1, 26 through 30. And so that's what a lot of the lesson last week was about. <clears throat> but this week, <clears throat> we continue to look at the fact that Jesus is 100% God and 100% man. The humanity of Jesus just kind of continues in the in this week as we continue to look through uh, verses 10 through 18 of chapter 2. Uh, the Hebrew writers really fighting the, the doctrine, the false doctrine of docetism. And uh, as docetism teaches that Jesus was 100% God, but he was not man. And that's what a lot of this is, is about as the Hebrew writers fights that false doctrine of docetism. He wants to show that not only was Jesus 100% God, but also 100% man. And he did, uh, he did a great job of proving that last week, but he's just going to continue that thought this week. If you have your Bibles, let's look at verses 10 through 13 together. In verses 10 through 13, the Hebrew writer says, In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are, are, made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here I am, here am I, and the children God has given me. <coughs> the first thing I want to point out here is in verse 10. The verse 10 is an amazing verse when it says, in bringing me sons and daughters glory, it was Fitting that God for whom through all things exist. I, that word fitting is kind of an amazing little word to investigate here. Jesus becoming human, which is what he talked all about last week, right? Jesus becoming human and suffering and, and taking on flesh and dying on the cross. The Hebrew writer uses this word fitting. I mean, it was fitting that that would happen. I, it's such a... It's an interesting word to look into that he would choose here to talk about all of Jesus' life and taking on the flesh and being human, how it was fitting. Conceivably, conceivably, God could have engineered uh, some way to save us that did not require the suffering of the Son of God. Uh, but the, the Hebrew writer uses this, the phrase here, but the way that was chosen, the way that God did choose to do it, it was fitting. It all worked. All the puzzle, puzzle pieces came together. Imagine the biggest jigsaw puzzle in the world and all the pieces just came perfectly together and fit perfectly. That's what the Hebrew writer is trying to, to demonstrate with Jesus. Maybe, you know, maybe the, the question is, maybe Jesus could have found another way, maybe this other way. But the way that, did, that God did use, everything fit together perfectly. And that's what the, the Hebrew writer is trying to use with this particular word. It is the ultimate frustration of real love, real giving, real true sacrifice. That's why it's fitting is because, because Jesus, not only did he come and die for our sins and all that aspect, but he gave us an example of what real, you know, looking at Jesus on the cross and everything, we say, well, was there a different way? Well, maybe there was some different other way, but what else? Could there be that would have demonstrated for us the kind of love and giving and sacrifice we need to make in our lives? You see, when we look at the cross, we don't just see Jesus the Savior. We see Jesus the example of how I'm to live. And that's what the Hebrew writer is trying to say. that It's fitting everything about the cross. As horrible as it is, it was fitting. It, because it gives us an ultimate example of how we are to be. Was there a better way to demonstrate those lessons to, to his followers than the cross? I, I can't imagine one, but, 
but the Hebrew writer makes the point here, it doesn't matter if there was some different way, the way that it was done by God, it was fitting. Every puzzle piece was put together completely. Uh, Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. That's what the, the scripture said. It said Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. There at the end of verse 10, uh, it, it says that exact thing. The salvation was made perfect through what he suffered. Now that, that little phrase there is, I mean, we can say amen to that, but there's a part of that we have to kind of deal with too because the question then comes up was, wasn't Jesus already perfect in his deity? Uh, well, you know, if he was made perfect by suffering in the flesh, then that would make it sound like maybe he wasn't perfect before flesh. You know, and so we have to kind of struggle with that particular verse a little bit. But I don't think that it was saying that Jesus wasn't perfect in his deity. That's not what this was saying. All, the, all that this verse is trying to say, all the Hebrew writers trying to point out here, was there's nothing lacking in Jesus' Jesus's deity, is him being God. You know, he, he didn't lack omniscience or omnipotence or omnipresence. It was, he didn't lack any of those. It was, he's, not, he's not lacking in being God. He was only lacking in experience of the flesh. That was the one thing that God, that, that he couldn't understand because he had never been in flesh. And so that's what the whole writer thing is saying. Jesus, by taking flesh, it's fitting because not only do we have this example and not only did he take care of us spiritually and everything, but it's so fitting because he, he got to experience the flesh. See, God is holy. It means he's removed. He's separated. For he doesn't get tempted by the things we're tempted with. He doesn't deal with the pains that we are tempted with. All the, he's God. And so the Hebrew writer is trying to make a point here that, that Jesus, being God, was made perfect because he experienced what we go through in the flesh. And that was one thing that Jesus, as God, was not able to know he did it. And so this, this aspect, the, the, the question, was Jesus perfect before taking flesh? Well, yes, he was perfectly God, but he lacked that experience of the flesh. But when he took flesh on, then he became even more perfect. That's what the Hebrew writer is trying to explain here. This verse does not imply any kind of moral imperfection of Jesus, but an experiential understanding of sorrow and pain that God needed to pass through to become the leader of salvation. And that's what this particular verse is talking about. The method that Jesus, that God developed was fitting. And now that God has had that experience of flesh, we can now all be in one holy family. That's what, that's what the writer's trying to say. Because God he was made perfect by taking on the flesh and having that experience and knowledge of flesh. Because he did that, now we can all be in one family. We can all belong to that same holy human family. As humans, we can be in the same family as God because Jesus was both. You see, the, the, great, the greatness of this particular verse in this particular section of scripture is just packed full of depth. And what he's saying here, Jesus is human, 100% human, because he calls us a human names. He calls us brothers and sisters. He calls us humans, his brothers and sisters. And the only reason he can do that, the only reason he can call us brothers and sisters as part of his family is because he took on flesh because he himself was human. God could not do that without having had that human experience. If God was just spiritual and never took on flesh, he couldn't call us humans brothers and sisters. He's too removed from, from fleshly uh, dealings to be able to call us his family. But because Jesus took on flesh and be, became a human and he experienced humanity, he now has the right to say, you people are my brothers and my sisters. And so the point, of, again, from the Hebrew writers, Jesus is fully human. He calls us his brothers and his sisters. 
We don't let the, the, the depth and the importance of when Jesus says, you are my brothers and sisters, don't just miss that. <clears throat> There's so much depth to that. And that's what the Hebrew writer is pointing out. And not only that, but the Hebrew writer goes one more step further. He says, not only does he call his brothers and sisters, but he does so without shame. He does it without any shame at all. He can do so because he is a human like us. You know, I don't live like I should. You don't live like you should. We're all sinners. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. And you say, well, how could God even want to call me brother? Says, he was, Jesus is so holy and so perfect and so good. He should be ashamed to call me a sinner, his brother. No, and that's what the whole Hebrew writer is saying. He, does, he calls you brother and sister without shame because he's experienced temptation. He understands when you fall. He didn't fall, but he understands when you do. He knows how hard it was to live in flesh. And because of that empathy, he has no shame in calling sinners his brother and sisters. That's why he makes you perfect. Because he understands what you're trying to do. You're trying to live right. And so because of that, he calls you brothers and sisters. What a powerful, powerful message. If he's not ashamed to call us his family, then should we be ashamed to belong to him? This morning we talked about we have the power and authority and that we shouldn't shy away from being called Christian. You know, so, so many times the, with the culture attacking Christianity the way it is, sometimes we're, we may be ashamed to call ourselves Christians because we may come across not politically correct or whatever. And if, if Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brother and sister, we should not be ashamed of it either, no matter what comes our way. No matter what comes our way, we should not be ashamed to be in the family of God. There are three evidences that Jesus calls us his brother. The Hebrew writer here lists three Old Testament evidences to prove that Jesus calls us brother. And that we read Psalm chapter 22, verse 22. That was one of the Old Testament references that the Hebrew writer used to prove that Jesus calls us brother. He used Isaiah 8, 17, and he used Isaiah 8, 18. These three evidences that, that the Hebrew writer pulled in from the Old Testament to demonstrate, to show us that God was willing to associate with humans as, is as, a, as a one big common family together. And that's why we as humans can be in the family of God because Christ became human. Let's look at verses 14 through 16. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who are who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. But surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. So now he's already shown that Jesus is our brother and why he's our brother, because he took flesh and he became human. That's why he's our brother. But you may ask the question, okay, well, what is that? The fact that Jesus is my brother, what does that do for me? I don't see him, right? I mean, I, I can call up my brother. I can do all kinds of things with my brother here on earth, but I can't do much with Jesus. What does he do for me? Well, that's what the, the scripture now addresses. And the Hebrew writer says, Jesus, as your brother, does a lot for you. He took on flesh and blood, which means he entered the prison to set the captives free. That's what is going on here. The man, the Hebrew writer is pointing out that, that Jesus, he didn't just stand outside the prison and say, hey, I hope you guys make it. I hope you're doing it. He actually entered the prison and worked from within to set free the captives. That's what Jesus did as our brother. Jesus took on flesh and blood. He didn't have to. He was God. But he did it. He came in and took that flesh and blood for us. And as doing, and so doing, the second thing is a brother. Not only was he willing to do that, become lower than the angels and become a human, but two, he beat Satan. And he destroyed the power of death. In beating, in, in, in doing what he did, in coming and dying on the cross and rising again, it defeated every, all the power that Satan has. 
and he also released you from fear. We don't have to fear death. We, when death comes our way, it's an exciting time for us because we know we're going to enter through the door into eternity. So we're excited and it removes all the fear from death. It releases you from being scared of that day when we have to, to die because it means we get to go through to heaven. And the fourth thing that it says it, that, that Jesus as a human brother does for us is he gives us aid and he helps us as a as a human family he provides help for us and then verse 16 says it is not angels he helps it's not the angels he helps it's the human beings it's the descendants of abraham the flesh and blood people that's what jesus as a brother does for us let's look at verses 17 through 18 it says for this reason he had to be made like them fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. So now he points out the fact that, the, that Jesus taking on flesh means something else. Not only is that man, he's, he's he showed that Jesus in the flesh means so much, but he goes, let me give you one more. Now, Jesus being in the flesh means that he's our faithful high priest. The only the humans could be high priests. If he were not human and he was just only God, then he couldn't be the high priest because that was a role for a human being. The role of a high priest was to be the liaison, to be the between guy between the humans and God. And so it was a fleshly duty. So the fact that Jesus is our high priest tells you he was human. The job was to represent the people before the Father, to take the sins, to make atonement for the sins. That was the job of a man. And now Jesus is that for us. Jesus is our high priest the high priest wore a breastplate in the Old Testament, and in the breastplate it had 12 stones, and then it represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Each had a color and everything, but it, it was also engraved with the names of the tribe of Israel. And that was very significant, because what that meant is the high priest would always wear the tribes, would wear the names of the tribes, wear the names of the people by his heart. It was a, it was a symbolistic thing. In that the high priest was in constant sympathy. It was the people were near his heart. And he would always wear the people near his heart when he went before God. And so that was the, the significance. And now we have Jesus who is our high priest. In other words, when Jesus took on flesh, he now can have the sympathy and the empathy of knowing what it is to be in flesh. And so Jesus carries our needs and carries our names in, on his heart. And in his chest, in his work that he does for us. Because Jesus is human, he can now serve in that role of the high priest and being that, that liaison between us and the Father. Because he knows the human experience, he can be in constant sympathy of knowing what our hearts are going through. Isn't that an amazing thing to know? Is that God in heaven knows. He knows. He knows what we go through. He knows what you go through. When you feel the loss of a loved one, he knows he was in flesh. He dealt with loss. He dealt with pain. He dealt with being rejected. All the things that you hurt with, he knows. God knows because he lived it in the flesh. What an encouragement it is to know that God knows the pains of that you are going through. God took on the human flesh so he could be our high priest, so he could call us brother and sister. Are you ready to be a part of his family? All you need to do is give up your life to him, and you can be a part of the family of God as well. Maybe if you need to respond tonight, you can call one of the elders, you can call myself, we'll pray with you, we'll, whatever your need is. You just reach out and let us know. Let's sing this final song together and then we'll close out. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. 
Let us haste, oh haste, to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above. And he bids us all freely drink. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the word come call. Tis a fountain. Open for all. There's a living stream with a crystal gleam from the throne of life. Now it flows while the waters roll at the weary soul. Hear the call that forth freely goes. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, hear the well. Come, come, tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft, and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me, and its stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come to the fountain free? Will you come? Tis for you and me, thirsty soul. Hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. Thank you, Brother Stan, for sharing that message and really bringing home that Jesus was separated from his Father for our sins. He bore the sins of the world. Thank you, Brother Mark, for leading that wonderful song service. And will you uh, bow with me as we close out our evening worship service and prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you thanking you for allowing us to be able to worship you in spirit and truth and live in a country where that's allowed and, and free. Lord, as we dismiss, watch over us, I pray that the message touch the hearts of someone and, and causes them to draw nearer to you and want to be your child and want to know Jesus. Lord, till our next appointed time, keep us safe. Forgive us of our sins, Lord. These things I ask in Jesus Christ's name, amen.